two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Jake's Take with Jacob Ali Show podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Ali Show, the chief content producer and writer of jakestake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. And I am so happy to have my latest guest with me. He is a singer, songwriter. He's an author at Gay Nerd, and he's a former Huffington Post core contributor. Please help me welcome Kenneth. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hi. Kenneth, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Oh, thank you for having me. This is awesome. Thank you so much. All righty. So when did you get first interested in music and how did that passion evolve into desire to preserve your career in the recording industry? So I ever, I, as long as I can remember, I've, I've loved music and been in doing stuff with music. And I, my great grandmother used to say that I was the most well-behaved baby in church until the choir started singing. And then I had to go and sing and dance and be up there with them. So she said she knew at that age that I was going to do do music. And then I sang all throughout church and in school. And, and then I started pursuing it professionally when I moved out here to California. And, um, I just haven't stopped, I guess. (laughs) All righty. So can you please describe your songwriting process to my audience? So my songwriting process is a little bit all over the place. It kind of just depends. Like there'll be moments where, I'll be talking to someone at a party or whatever, and all of a sudden I'll just get hit with this idea and I'll have to run off by myself and look like a weirdo so I can hum out these, you know, melody or write these lyrics. And, and other times, you know, it's a, it takes forever because I'm trying to sit there to come up with a melody and lyrics and it doesn't work. And um, it's, so it's just, it's weird. I, it hits me at any point and it is like to sit by myself and, you know, create, I guess. <laughs> Sound a little weird. I'm sorry. <laughs> don't worry. You don't have to be sorry. Every mus- every singer and musician I've talked to has different processes. Good. That's uh, good. <laughs> absolutely. So do you have any musical music heroes and how do they make an impact you, on you? Um, so Tiffany's always been at the top of the list. Um, she's someone that I've listened to since I was, you know, teeny tiny little boy. And um, someone I've been lucky enough to kind of indirectly and directly sometimes kind of work with, you know, musically and otherwise. Um, The single, I released a single last year called Holy Water that she wrote with a friend of hers. That's so, I'm so excited about it. It's such a great song. And and so to have her kind of have heard some of my songs and, and she's just, she's amazing. I love how she kind of went from this little bubblegum mall girl to this really serious singer songwriter that does incredible music. Like she's so amazing and she's got such a great voice. And um, Alex Johnson is another one. She's a a Canadian singer, songwriter, actress. She's done everything. And she's another one that when you look at her, you just kind of see this blonde haired, blue eyed little Disney girl. And she's such an incredible artist and so serious about her craft and i have loved watching her evolve too because like so she kind of started off the, on the disney channel and kind of became this amazing singer songwriter and i've been lucky enough that they're they're my two big ones my two idols and i've gotten to know them and meet them and and it's still just kind of amazing awesome so what have been some of the challenges that you faced throughout your career and how did you overcome those obstacles so being an out artist, um, you know, I was, I came out when I was 15, you know, 13, you know, if you count counting friends. Um, and so I've never really hid that part of myself. And when I came out here, when I first started music, gay artists were kind of a novelty act. They were either singing super, super sexual songs or songs that were just done to get a laugh. And I'm, neither really one of those. I don't, you know, take off my clothes to sell my music and I, I'm not, I think I'm funny, but no one else does. So, (laughs) so I don't do that. And I kind of fell in the middle and was just like, you know what, I'm just going to be myself and kind of see what happens. And it was something that was a little nerve wracking when I first started because I was kind of put against like the Steve Grands and, um, you know, artists like that, that were, you know, physically beautiful 
And I was just kind of this weird little hick from Montana. And it was a little weird um, because I I was kind of told I'd have to change things. And I'm very stubborn, so I didn't. And it actually worked out in my favor. (laughs) Awesome. I'm glad that you did not let people change you. It's I think every single artist is different, no matter who they are, no matter if they're if they're start if they're basically if they're you or if they're Frankie Grande, then there's different. Yeah. Or all the way up to Lady Gaga or to or to Tiffany. There everyone is different and you cannot be a cookie cutter. Exactly. That that was the big thing is I didn't want to be some cookie cut out. And I just kind of embraced who I was and I did, you know, I did Unlock Your Heart, which was kind of a pop video and and had Ronnie Kroll in it and was super fun. And then my very next thing I did was very acoustic singer songwriter kind of stuff because I was told that as a queer artist, I could never do that. I would have to just do clubby sounding music. And I'm like, screw that. No way. I grew up with country music. I'm going to try, you know, try something different. And it worked. <laughs> and it seems like the gay country music scene is get, is finding it stronger, getting stronger every day. It is. It is. You've got Orville Peck now and a bunch of other artists that I'm, I'm so excited where queer artists have come. Because like I said, when I started, we were kind of the novelty acts. We were the, you know, super sexual or super funny artists that they kind of just put out there to kind of, you know, basically porn stars doing music kind of a thing. And now we've got a mate like Troy Sivan and Orville Peck and even Steve Grandin and a bunch of other artists that have entered into the mainstream and are doing you know, not gay songs, but just songs. And it's really, it's really been awesome to see. Awesome. So guys, basically how I met Kenneth was over Facebook and he sent me his, a link to his album called Star Stealer. So I did take a look at it and I really liked it. And it's on the jakestake.com new music review. So you go on the music tab and the, or type in Kenneth's name, he's under it. So I would love to talk to you about some of my favorite tracks. Yes, please. I am so excited about Star Sealer. And your review made me smile so big. So, so thank you so much. I was so excited. You're so welcome. I will, I will get a lot of artists that come to, come to me, but at the same time, I'm like, I have to listen to their music. And if I'm not, a, and if I'm not connecting with you, I'm, you're not going to be featured, but however, your music connected with me. Yay. So. All righty, Kenneth. So let me start off with you and me. I would love to hear the story about that. <laughs> so you and me actually is from the Jetsons movie from 1990 and um, was the first Tiffany song I ever covered. Um, it was written by two men, uh, Stephen McClintock and Tim James. And I sent it to Stephen just kind of like, like a, hey, I did a thing and didn't really expect anything. And he immediately wrote me back and told me how much he loved it and recommended I pick up two of the other songs that he had written for Tiffany to kind of see, you know, how I sounded on them. And you and me, I, I first recorded it back in, I think probably 2015 or 2016. And it went through so many different machinations of how it was going to sound. And it. I'm so proud of it. Like I, I have fought so hard for that song and Steven has kind of been my champion with that song as well. You know, making sure that it sounded good, that it it felt right. And I, it's just such, it's a little rockier, more rock and roll than I, than I normally do. So that was really fun too, to kind of get into that kind of gritty kind of sound. And, oh, it was, it's just, and it's just fun. It's just a fun love song. Awesome. I just want to say your cover, Tony Basil's Mickey, took me back to my bar mitzvah and my brother Aaron's bar mitzvah, my cousin Mike's bar mitzvah, because in Kansas City at the time, it was, we had a DJ who loved doing that song. We used to make up dances <laughs> to it. And so how did you get your hands on Mickey? So Mickey was one that my agent actually pitched to me and he was like, you know, you might, you might have some fun with this song. And I, I remembered it as a child, but I, I didn't really, it, it wasn't, it wasn't Tiffany or Belinda Carlisle. So I was like, it's okay. And so, so I, I gave it a shot and I went into the studio after a huge fight with my boyfriend 
I was livid. Like I was so mad. I'm like, this is going to be awful. I'm going to hate this. And we did like two takes and the producer was like, I don't know what you did, but this is awesome. And it was so much fun. And I gave it to Alexis Arquette, um, who was a good friend of mine at the time. And I sent it to her and I was like, you have to hear this. I want your honest opinion. Is it any good? And she, (laughs) she called me back and she's like, not only do I love it, but I sent it to Tony and she thinks it's great. And I fell off my chair. So I I was like, I freaked out. I'm like, Tony Basil now knows who I am. And, and I was like, it was just an incredible, incredible experience. And every time I would come over to see Alexis, she would always put on that song and we would always have to dance around and play dress up and just be total geeks. And oh my God. So that's why it's on Star Star Stealer because it reminds me so much of Alexis and she was such a huge supporter of me in the beginning. And, and so I wanted to do that kind of little dedication to her. Awesome. And I think she would, she would, she would be proud of you about this album. I, I think so. I think so. All righty, so let's do another rock of your another rocky track. Live your life, be free. I love that one. Um, that that's another one. I that song took us probably ten hours to record. Um, wow! The producer and I, yeah, we it just I we couldn't get it right. And it's a it was it's my favorite Belinda Carlisle track. It's from her, my favorite album of hers. And I'm like, I am not going to, you know, half-ass this. It's got to be good. And so we did so many different takes and, you know, tried so many different things. And, and then we finally got it. And my, my agent hated it. He absolutely hated the song. And all of my other friends were like, this is this is really good. You need to put this on something. So I finally was able to put it on Star Stealer. And it's such a fun – it's that song especially because in Belinda's version – She's singing to a man who has a girlfriend uh, or wife or however you want to look at it. And it's like, you know, you're not happy. You you don't want to be with that person. I want you to be with me. And we click. And so, you know, you should really live your life, be free and, and be with me. And I didn't change gender tones. I didn't do anything like that. So I kind of did the same thing where I see you, the man I'm seeing to you, you're with this woman. You know, you're not happy. You know, you want something else, you know while we're still young, you should really live your life how you want to live it. And someone pointed out to me that it was, it was very like a prolific statement. And I'm like, I didn't think about it that way, but I guess. And it's just, it's such a, it's just such a fun kind of upbeat song about being true to who you are and what you want. All righty. Let's talk about leave a light on for me. Hmm, That's another Belinda one. I can remember dancing around in little onesie footy pajamas to that song and watching the music video when it would come on MTV and she's in the desert looking like she stepped out of Vogue. And I was like, I want to be her. Like, I just thought she was so glamorous and beautiful and her voice. There's something about her voice that just can give me goosebumps. Like she's got such an amazing voice. And when you hear her, you know, it's Belinda Carlisle, like just from a note. And she's so amazing. And leave a light on. I had so much fun recording this one because it, it's that, you know, I'm coming back to you no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I go, I'm going to come back to you. And when, at the time when I was recording it, I had a boyfriend that was, a little upset that I was trying to do music stuff because he thought that I would like kind of take me away from him. And I was like, you know, this is, I'm still going to come back. Like you're my partner here. So it, it really, it's one of those songs that kind of means a lot to me and I kind of ramble on. I'm very sorry. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. This is the Jake's Take with Jacob Elisher podcast is a place for people to talk and share their stories. Oh, good. <laughs> All right, so finally, I would love to talk with the song that I've been playing constantly over and over on repeat. Your cover of Tiffany's I Think We're Alone Now. <laughs> so I Think We're Alone Now has, it's, it's a very important song to me. I, it was the first 45 I ever owned. My parents bought it for me when I was, I don't know, three, I think, when it came out, two or three. And I have not stopped listening to it 
since. Like I at least once a day will play I Think We're Alone Now to the point where the last time I was home, I was doing something and I was singing the song and my dad threw something at me from across the room and said, it has been 30 bleeping years, choose a new bleeping song. (laughs) (laughs) I just started, I looked, I turned around, I looked at him, I'm like, I'm going to tell Tiffany, you said that. And he's like, good. (laughs) And, and so, and it, so I, I knew from the beginning that I had to record, I think we're alone now. And it's another one that went through so many different, different versions. It went through a rock version, a techno version. I think I even tried a K-pop version. And I was like, cause I'm like, I'm not going to do just a cover of Tiffany's version of the song. I can't just lift what she did because not only because, you know, I, I kind of know her, but it's also, I'm like, that's just kind of cheap. And so I got it stripped back. There was a version that I heard that she did live once, like back in 2000. That was this very kind of acoustic rock. And so we kind of based it off that and did very minimal drums and effects because I wanted it to be different than any other version that was out there. And I was so scared to put it on the album just because it is such an iconic song and one that... I get associated with because of, of anyone that knows me, knows how much I love it. And I'm like, I really am very scared that people are going to hate this rendition because it was so different. And everybody that I talk to that has told me about it loves it. And so it makes me, I'm very, very, very proud. And I'm so glad that you like it. And it, it, it means a lot. Cause like I said, I was really nervous about putting it on the album. So, so you made me feel a lot more comfortable about it. I'm glad, glad to hear it because the first time I heard Tiffany's song was actually actually on The View because they surprised Sarah Haynes and co-host Sarah Haynes and brought Tiffany to sing the song. And I fell in love with instantly because unfortunately I wasn't in listening, the listening ears because growing up in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, it was the big pop explosion with Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and Britney and Christina, the Spice Girls, and then Usher so it was like, I had a lot more music and Destiny's Child. So I had a lot more music to listen to. Yes. <laughs> All righty. So oh, speaking shame. of those artists, who are your dream collaborators, which are the singers, songwriters, and producers, and how would they enhance their sound? So I actually, I actually told Alex Johnson yesterday, I said, I'm going to m- mention you in this, this interview I'm doing. And I said, I want to talk about how much I want to work with her just because of her songwriting style and her voice and who she is as a person. Um, Belinda Carlisle would be another one that I don't think I'd ever be able to work with because I'd probably faint. Um, But I've gotten to, Gabe Lopez is a producer that I love um, and he actually works a lot with Belinda and Backstreet Boys and New Kids on the Block and all these people that I've listened to and we've actually worked on a song together. So I've gotten to, Anyone that I've, I've kind of wanted to meet or work with, I've kind of gotten to somehow meet and reach out to. And it's been super, super awesome because like with Gabe, he had something different to my my sound that I've never had before. And he's got such a good ear and he's such a great songwriter. And and so, yeah, so there's, there's like I said, Belinda will probably be the one that if I ever get the chance, I would love it, but I probably wouldn't actually be able to do it because I'd be such a fanboy. She, I'd probably scare her. <laughs> Believe me, there are people I've done that before with fam, with people that I've met in the industry, and it's and I've had like, oh crap, did I go fam too too much fanboy? Oh, I've I've done that, and I <laughs> I met Lana Perea, who was the evil queen on Once Upon a Time. Oh my God, one of my all time favorite oh, actresses. She's... She sorry, I'm sh- when I I fell in love with her instantly when she said, "Sorry, I'm late," and just straight her way to the wedding and said, "I will destroy my happy your happiness. It's the last thing I do." She oh she's I saw her across the stage, and I literally like power walked up to her. And I was like, hi, I'm Kenny. And I think you're so amazing. And I just love you. And I like gushed it. Cause she's like, she was very sweet. She's like, oh, thank you. And then I, I'm like, Kate, thanks. Bye. <laughs> and I turned around and I walked away. I was like, oh, I didn't ask her for a picture. And I spun on my heels and I went back and I'm like, 
can I get a picture? And she crossed her arms and she's like, you know, you went on and on about how much you love me. I was really hurt that you didn't ask me for a photo. <laughs> she started howling. She was so funny. And she put me at ease so much. And she was, oh my gosh, she was just Oh, you, everything you would have wanted to be in more. She was so nice and so amazing. And like I said, so funny. She played because she knew how nervous I was. And she's like, yeah, I was really hurt. You didn't ask me and just made it, you know, broke the tension. It was great. Oh, believe me. I almost, I almost wanted to, like, I was a PA back in Kansas City when the show The X Factor UK was on, when, when, the, when the X Factor USA was on Fox and they were in Kansas City and uh-huh. they did cattle calls. Um I actually was working with the contestants and doing paperwork, going back to production central. And then all of a sudden I see two stylists walk on by and then I look inside the guest dressing room and it's Brittany freaking Spears. Oh my gosh. So oh I imagine, so I was like a quick and grit and then flash out of there because the thing is I didn't want to get fired. Yeah, I, I I worked at Disney and I crossed paths with Carrie Fisher and I like had to be like professional, but at the same time, it's Carrie freaking Fisher. Like, and I just, all I did as I walked by, I was like, I love you. You're amazing. And she just starts, oh, I love you too, honey. And <laughs> that was it. But it was so, I was like, I couldn't not say anything to her. Her and, and I also geeked out over Jody Benson when I met her, but it's just like, I couldn't help it. I'm a little gay boy at Disney and you meet these idols and I have to fanboy. And at least I was, you know, mostly coherent. <laughs> All right. So in addition to your musicianship, you and I have a thing in common and we are both writers at heart. And I would love to have that, the opportunity that you had because you also contributed for a time to the Huffington Post. So how did your time with that platform help you increase your writing and storytelling abilities? That the writing when I was blogging for HuffPost was really awesome because it made me sound a lot more important than I was and or than I was and got me into places that I never would have dreamed to kind of get into. And I did a big piece on Rainbow Bright with Hallmark, which is one of the properties growing up and where the star sealer name came from. And, and you know, I, I did interviews with Tiffany and Melissa Joan Hart and all of these people. And they really kind of gave me the freedom to do whatever I wanted. Like, it was just like, it's your platform. Just, you know, make sure it's not, you know, profane or whatever. There were very few limitations on what, um, what I could and couldn't do. And I just got whatever, like, and it was so much, so much fun and got me in contact with celebrities and people that, kind of became friends like like with Alex Johnson I did so many reviews and interviews and stories and we were sitting together at the hotel cafe and you know doing some an interview for an album that she had just done and she's like she's looked at me she's like okay so I have a question for you and I'm like okay and she's like why did you never tell me you were an artist <laughs> I said because I don't mix press and and music I said it's it's different and and so it it kind of opened doors in other ways because I wasn't being opportunistic about it. I was working with them about them, and then they you know would find things out and then offer to kind of help me like I was doing with them. And it was really a amazing experience to work with them. And now writing for for Gay Nerd as well, it um, gives me the, the same thing with that. The guy that owns that site's a, a dear friend. And he basically said, whatever you want to do, anything at all, just let me know and have fun. And so I've, I've gotten to meet people and do things and, and review things that I never really thought I would get a chance to do. And it's really cool. All righty. So let's talk about social media, shall we? So what have been some of your favorite social media platforms? Is it Facebook? Is it Instagram? Is it YouTube? Is it TikTok? And why do they stand out? So Instagram is the one I'm probably most comfortable with because it's just like, here's a picture, here's a blurb. There you go. Cause I am crap with social media. I am so bad at my, that has been every agent and manager I've ever worked with. They're like, you really suck at social media (laughs) because I don't really know what to do. And I would always post like, here's a great thing. My, My album, here's Alex Johnson's album. Here's a picture of this Turkey I just made. And they're like, you have no flow. You have no consistency. 
And and so Instagram, my my best friend finally got me to a spot where I know what I can and cannot post now. So that's my favorite, just because it it's the one I know the most. <laughs> and I crap with Twitter, and I've never I'm too old for TikTok. Um, so that's one that I'll probably never do. Although I have heard that my songs are now on TikTok. So I have friends that are like, we're going to make little, little videos. I'm like, great, you do that because that'll be great. And I'll share them. But I am way too old to do TikTok. And then I'll start Uh, one next week. I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) All righty. So this is the second to last question. If you had the opportunity to meet with aspiring musicians who want to increase their presence in the recording industry, what advice would you share with them? That it's your career and you have to be vocal about who you are and what you want. Because if you let people tell you who you want to be, it's going to be a lot more difficult for you to be taken authentically and for you to be who you want to be later on. So I would say just make sure as long as you're true to yourself, it doesn't it doesn't matter because who you are is going to be, is going to be enough for people. And there's going to be someone that is thankful that you are doing what you're doing. Awesome. So Kenneth, the last question, where can my audience find you on social media? And also where can they stream or download your music? So all the music is on every, every platform, Spotify, Amazon, iTunes, there's going to be a physical disc available through Amazon too, which I'm excited about. Um, and then everything's just under Kenneth Mogan, K-E-N-Y-T-H-M-O-G-A-N. And then every social media is super simple. It's just Kenneth official. Awesome. Awesome. So everyone, if you want to hear more episodes of Jake's Take with Jacob on your podcast, you could go online to Apple Podcasts, to Google Podcasts, to Spotify and Spreaker. Just type Jake's Take with Jacob Elishar, J-A-K-E-S. Take with J A C O B E L Y A C H A R E L Y A C H A R. You can also go to jakes take.com to read more of my interviews and my music reviews, including you'll find Star Studio by Kenneth Mogan on there. And then once again, it's jakes take.com. And finally, if you're on social media, so am I. You can Facebook, Facebook request me. Instagram, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter, and also more importantly, follow me on YouTube because I post a lot of my interviews on there as well. It's Jacob, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Kenneth, thank you so much for the incredible conversation. Thank you so much for having me. This was fantastic. Thank you. All righty. Have a great day, everybody. And thank you so much for tuning in. Bye.